Um, well, welcome to today's Knowledge Equity Dialogue. So my name's Nick, um, Nick Shepherd. I'm um, Open Research Advisor here at the University of Leeds and also uh, Senior Lead for the Knowledge Equity Network. So for those that are perhaps not familiar with the Knowledge Equity Network, it's a collaborative network of higher education institutions, organisations and individuals walking to, working towards the principles outlined in the Declaration on Knowledge Equity. So if you haven't seen that, um, I'll if I just change to the next slide, there's a QR code there that will take you to that declaration. So please have a read. And if you haven't done so already, then sign up to the principles of the declaration and perhaps encourage your organization or institution to do the same. And through these webinars, um, we're working really to promote open education, open research, equity, diversity, inclusion, technology for all, um, and to look at alternative models of reward and recognition at a global scale is what, you know, it's not ambitious or anything. So that's what we're trying to um, encourage, you know, with a collaborative focus, as I say, at a global scale. So please do reach out to our team if you haven't done so already. There's a couple on the call today um, to discuss how we might collaborate with you to discuss, to, you know, really bring change across the sector, um, as I say, again, on a global scale. So I'm going to introduce our speakers in a moment, but very quickly first, um, well, so I'll just mention their names because I'm conscious they're on the screen. So uh, very pleased today to welcome uh, Dr. Hussain Masam Masumi Karakani. I hope I'm saying your name right, um, Hussain, and Dr. Michalisi um, Masango um, from our Ken co-founding partner organisation, the University of Pretoria. Uh, so we'll be talking about their perspectives on university rankings in the context of sub-Saharan Africa in particular. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to highlight that this event actually follows on from a previous event that some colleagues may have attended with uh, Lizzie Gadd, who I'm sure many colleagues do know if you didn't come to that event. Um, and in fact, Hussein was in fact scheduled to speak at that event, but um, for various reasons wasn't able to join us. So just before I do hand over to, to Hussein and Michalisi this afternoon, I just wanted to quickly recap some of the uh, things that Lizzie was talking about at that tour, which you can actually catch on the Ken YouTube channel. So hopefully Tom or another colleague can post a link to that into the, into the chat. But really, Lizzie was sort of emphasising uh, while acknowledging the importance of not imposing agendas on the global south and um, also perhaps other communities in the global north and really highlighting the fact that i think many of us are already aware of that ranking significantly significantly impact various actors in higher education you know like whether that's governance governments institutions themselves funders and students and also as i've sort of pulled out there that university rankings tend to favor old large wealthy research intensive institutions in the global north which obviously can perpetuate existing inequalities and also the heavy reliance on bibliometric data, which is also biased towards the global north, can further exacerbate those issues. So that was kind of the context that, as I say, we were hoping to involve the same with that discussion at that time, but for various reasons we can't. So we're very pleased to welcome him today to um, follow on from that. So uh, without further ado, I'll actually hand over, I think, to you, Michalisi, first, won't you? Because Michalisi, I know you've got to leave a little earlier before, just before one o'clock our time. So thank you for joining us in this short window that you have, and um, I'll stop sharing my slides and hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nick, and good afternoon, colleagues. So I'm going to do the first part of the presentation, uh, colleagues, just to give a South African perspective in terms of uh, where we are with regards to the higher education uh, sector and what are some of the implications, especially of participation in terms of rankings, given uh, you know our, our our context. So that's the first part that I'm going to cover. Then Hossein will come in uh, with regards to the uh, sub-Saharan uh, terms higher uh, rankings, and then I think it's going to go into more details. Uh, Hossein, if you can just go to the next slide, please. So colleagues, just to give uh, some uh, background and perspective in terms of how the higher education uh, sector is formatted in South Africa. So we have got 26 public universities that are funded by government. And then in addition to that, we have what is called Tibet co uh, colleges, that is technical and vocational education and training colleges, which are more equivalent to the community colleges when you're looking at the US. Uh, so I think they, given our history here in South Africa, uh, we normally say our higher education system is differentiated, which means we've got two distinct uh, group of uh, universities. So we've got those 
that are classified as historically disadvantaged institutions. And predominantly, when you look at their uh, profile, you'll see that they are uh, predominantly Black. So whether you're looking at the student population, even uh, the profile of the academic staff. So it's predominantly Black African. And usually these universities, they are located you know, in far off uh, rural areas where access to resources is 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 you know is a bit of a challenge so that is the first category and then the second one we have what is called uh, historically advantaged institutions those are predominantly white and they tend to be located in urban areas and the the other distinguishing factor between the two institutions is that uh, the hdis they rely more on government funding whereas the hais they usually have large, you know, reserves in terms of their funding. They're able to even raise, uh, you know, third uh, stream income in terms of their uh, financial sustainability. And then the next slide, uh, Hussein. So when you're looking at our landscape, uh, colleagues. So one of the things that we have here in South Africa, we have our national development plan, which projects where the country is supposed to be by 2030. So it looks at the various sectors, including the higher education space. So I've picked up here uh, some of the uh, KPAs from the DHET strategic plan. So one of the things that they are mentioning here, for example, is by this year, our target for increasing the number of students' enrollment in the 26 public universities uh, is why is, is the sitting at around 1.13 uh, 1.1 uh, million so that's the target uh, for this year and then it further talks about you know completion rates uh, that you want to increase the number of students who are completing a university uh, qualification up to 237 want to increase the number of masters graduates and phd's so all of that is contained at a national level and then the next slide uh, it's it, it paints, a, I think, a, a, a bleak picture in terms of uh, when you look at the progression. Uh, so here, the figure on the left, you, we're looking at those uh, group of individuals who completed their metric, which is the highest uh, qualification before you enter into uh, a university. So we're looking at the 20, 2008 cohort who who, who who completed their metric. So if you go back 12 years, uh, if you track them 12 years back, when they entered uh, grade one, the basic higher education, and then we're looking, we're taking a, a, a group of 100 students. So say 100 students, they started 12 years ago. And when looking at how they are progressing, you will see that of those 100, only six, uh, 60, sorry, will make it in terms of completing uh, and be eligible to write their metric. So about 40 of those uh, are already lost within the basic uh, higher education system. And then of those that are writing the exam, uh, the metric exam, you see that only 37 of those uh, are able to pass the metric. And then you look at those who qualify to with the bachelor's passes so that then they're able to enter into universities is about 14 of those. And of those 14, uh, you will have about nine that will go immediately uh, to university and then three will go later. So that speaks to the university access. And then you further track them. And then when you look at those that will complete their degree within six years of completing their metric, you will see that it's only four. So you will see that our system, higher education system here in South Africa, both the, both the basic and the higher education that focuses on, on universities will see that there's quite issues in terms of it being efficient because we tend to lose a lot of people. So this then shows you colleagues, some of the challenges that from, from our perspective here in South Africa, that we are grappling with uh, these issues in terms of how then we can be able to improve our system. And then the picture on the right, it simply shows you uh, the improvements in terms of the bachelor passes uh, starting from 2015 to 2023, you can still see that uh, we are sitting uh, just at about 40% of those that will write the metric and they obtain their bachelor's pass. So also, uh, it, 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 it speaks uh, uh, to the pool of students that are supposed to, uh, to come to the university. The next slide, uh, colleagues, will also show you in terms of now uh, the enrollment trends into the university. Here you will see on top, we're looking at 
the total undergrad uh, or, or the total enrollments, you will see that there's been an increase uh, when you're looking uh, between 2019 and 2021. But then the one which is more interesting will be the cohort, the first time entering. So that it means those are the new students who are coming from the basic education system into the university. You will see that the figures there, uh, they've dropped actually for the 2021 reporting year to slightly below 170,000. So this shows in terms of what are some of the topical issues. The next slide, uh, you will see it depicts also another side of uh, the progression of our students within the universities. So here, uh, I'm just looking at the dropout rates. So here I'm looking specifically at a three-year degree. So after the first year of study, so here we're looking at those students who came into the system, and then after the, their first year of study, uh, when you're looking at the three degrees, and then let's start with the initial year, the, uh, that is at uh, in, in 2000, you'll see that the dropout rate there for African students, that is black student, it was 28.6%. And then in 2015, it, it dropped down to 14.8. And then if you look at the different uh, racial groups, you'll see also that there is you know differentiation. Uh, African students, as well as college students, they tend to have high uh, dropout rates. So it means those are the students that we lose from the system. When you are comparing, for example, with the white students, which have lower uh, dropout rates. So all of these uh, colleagues, they speak to some of the challenges that uh, you know as South African universities were facing. The next slide also just highlights uh, at the national level, what are some of the key issues that you are grappling with? I'm sure uh, you've seen uh, in, in the media, when you're looking at our uh, unemployment stats, uh, the 2023 figures, when you look at the whole population, we're, we're sitting at 7.9 million of people who are unemployed uh, in South Africa at that time. And when you're looking at the rates, that is about 32.9%. And then when you look at the youth unemployment, so we're looking at those between the ages of 15 to 24, you will see that the figures, they are quite high, 62%. When you look at the age group, 25 to 34, uh, it, it, goes, it goes down slightly to around 41%. But what is interesting is when you're looking at the graduate unemployment, so talking about those that possesses university uh, diplomas, bachelor's, honors, master's, and PhDs, and they're actively seeking employment. So here, when you're looking at the first quarter of 2013, uh, 2013 you'll see that the graduate unemployment rate was sitting at around 5.5, and that increased to 10.6% in the first quarter of 2023. So here, what then we are seeing here is uh, that the distinction between those that possesses university qualifications against those who do not have any formal qualification. So it shows that uh, possessing a qualification or having education, especially within our context here in South African Africa, that is still a key for our young people to access the South African labor. So those are some of the challenges. And then the next slide I'm showing uh, challenges with regards to the financial sustainability of our higher education institutions. So I'm sure that once again, in the media, you've seen some of the recent events uh, that have impacted on our universities, including the famous fees must fall student protests between 2015 and 2016, where the government had to declare a zero uh, increase in our tuition. And that had a negative impact for many of our universities. We all know about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, where there were lockdown restrictions and associated increase in resource demands. Also within our uh, context, we are struggling with low shading and persistent power cuts. So that has led to some of the uh, you, you know expenses in terms of you know diesel consumption and spending uh, increasing. We also have the declining public fund, uh, declining public funding for universities where we don't know what's going going to happen in terms of you know student fees uh, with regards to payment of tuition fees accommodation and food and we also have challenges with our national student financial aid scheme so all of these uh, colleagues they highlight some of the key uh, uh, challenges as universities within uh, 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 south africa and africa we are facing in terms of what we need to deal with on daily basis the next slides uh, is going to be my my last slide in terms of what is the importance now of the rankings in line with our strategic goals as as universities. So I think here 
colleagues we will agree that in the last couple of years we've seen you know an increase in the number of university uh, world university rankings and that poses some challenges because then you need resources for the collection of the data the verification and the submission of 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 that data but then uh, also here in south africa and africa we have got those universities which are either research intensive or research led where as much as there are you know major gaps in terms of the met methodies uh, methodologies of these university world rankings but there are some benefits that can be derived from there so for example when we want to benchmark with international universities we want to look at you know our research output compared to you know to the global uh, landscape i think the rankings they've got room there uh, so those universities what then they tend to do is they then have to identify some of the rankings metrics that speaks directly to what they want to measure so what then colleagues i'm saying is given all of the challenges that we have especially within our south african context you can then uh, appreciate that our focus is not necessarily in chasing the rankings because some of these rankings they don't have measures for all of those things which i've mentioned in terms of assessing because i can tell you now that there are those universities that are excelling for example in ensuring that uh, they, are, they, they develop student support uh, systems and initiatives to reduce uh, dropout rates and improve uh, throughputs and success rates. But then when you're looking at the rankings, that is lacking. And for us here, that then becomes one of the critical issues. So if a university is able to ensure that even students coming from poor backgrounds, disadvantaged backgrounds, they come into the university, they are able to be supported by the university and be able to complete in the required uh, time. And then for us, that is a huge impact because then there are families that are, uh, are impacted by that. So this is where I'm coming with regards to our uh, perspective within the South African higher education uh, landscape of saying university uh, rankings, if we're performing well in the rankings, I think that is you know, good and well, but our priority and what is keeping us busy, colleagues, I'm sure that you've seen, we have more uh, you know, pressing issues as universities that we need to respond to so that then we're able to thrive. So if it happens that we excel in, in, in the world university rankings, I think that becomes a bonus. So uh, Nick, I'm going to stop here uh, so that then I can yeah. allow no, my colleagues. Thanks, my colleagues. I'm very conscious that you've uh, elsewhere to be. There was just one question that um, come came in through chat that I'll just put to you if that's okay. So Louise has just said that she was Surprised to hear you say that historically advantaged institutions are predominantly white, as the current university mature demographics indicate that 78% of undergraduate students are black and 22% are white. Um, so is Pretoria unusual in that regard, or could you comment further on, on that? <laughs> yeah, so I, I so I think when those definitions were, were, were formulated, remember we're looking at around, I think, 20 years ago, in, and those definitions, uh, I, I think they are still applicable, so they have not been changed. So we are correct uh, in terms of, for example, when you're looking at the University of Pretoria, and even most of the universities, uh, those that we can be able to label as historically uh, white universities or historically advantaged universities, when you look at their student profile, for example, you will see that in the last uh, 10 to five years, they've significantly changed in terms of you know, increasing the number of black uh, students as part of their uh, cohort. But in terms of that definition, we are not only looking at the student profile of demographics. As I said, we also look at, you know, financial standing of the universities, the infrastructure and all of those things. But yes, it's, it's correct. For some of the universities, you will see that when you're looking at the profile, it has significantly changed. And I think that is one of the things that I was saying for us, if a university has managed to, you know, to move into that how then do we assess that even at you know at the global uh, rankings level we are not able to do so because those are the issues which are specific for our context great thanks hopefully louise that's useful and do comment further but i do know michalisa that you need to leave us i think uh just about now if not um hang on for a couple of moments but uh, i will hang over hand over to hussein just one final quick point to make i don't know there is one colleague that has their hand up i'm not sure if that's an actor it's easy to press buttons by mistake etc but just to say that uh mics are off etc for, for participants so if you do have a question please do post it in the chat or in the q a function and that uh, a call to all colleagues as well to post any more questions in the chat or the well, idea of the Q&A and to say, and we'll pick that up at the at the end of the session. So uh, thank you and pass over to you, Hussein.
Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. Uh, just to confirm, I, I, I tried to convert the, the file into PDF format. Is it uh, better now in terms of visibility? Yeah, the, the slides are full screen now, so that's great. Thanks to say. Okay, well. perfect, I, just, I, just, I didn't want to interrupt Michele, Michele C before. But... Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, uh, young yeah, and colleagues. And thank you for inviting us to um, this interesting session. And uh, I think from, from, from my side, I think you've, you've heard uh, the, the challenges that we have specifically within the South African uh, context and in, in higher education. And I think uh, from my side, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, some of the world university rankings and uh, specifically uh, the one that was uh, launched only last year in 2023, the Times Higher Education uh, Sub-Saharan Rankings. And what does that mean in general in terms of uh, the impact? How is it going to uh, help universities and institutions? And uh, what are the, some of the gaps that still exist besides the fact that we have one specific uh, ranking created for the purpose of uh, Sub-Saharan um, African region. But yeah, I think in general, as, as, as we all know, uh, when we talk about uh, world university rankings in general, in terms of uh, the traditional metrics or traditional uh, parameters that we would be able to uh, evaluate and assess different uh, universities uh, around the globe, uh, most of the time they are focused on four key uh, indicators or metrics, uh, which is around teaching, research, uh, knowledge transfer, and at the same time, um, a global outlook as well. But at the same time, when we are looking at these uh, broad uh, kind of uh, pillars that we have, which is more or less uh, the, the kind of uh, drivers for all of the institutions around the world, at the same time, we know that there are various uh, submetrics and subparameters that are linked to these specific key areas. For example, when we talk about uh, teaching, it is about uh, student success, it is about uh, how many students are able to uh, continue with their studies, how many students are able to uh, transfer from the first year of their studies to the second year, and so forth. When it comes to research, for example, we are looking at the, the number of uh, publications with uh, Global North, for example, uh, citations, H matrix, and so forth. And then that's more or less the, the idea with the other parameters that we have, uh, especially when it comes to uh, global outlook and uh, knowledge transfer. And I try to uh, look at uh, three uh, specific uh, rankings. I know that the number of rankings are also uh, in quite uh, increased uh, significantly compared to the to the last uh, five to to ten years. But then at the same time, I think. The, the key ones that mostly the higher education sector is actually interested in is QS, THE, and Shanghai. And again, based on what they're interested in, there are various uh, metrics and indicators that they want to evaluate universities uh, based on that. But the, the, the key question here is, when we talk about world university rankings, uh, of course, there is a historical perspective around that topic as well when it was first uh, created back in the 20th uh, century. And uh, it was mostly in terms of uh, focusing on uh, research output and try to identify research intensive uh, universities. And at the same time, it was about the university's uh, academic and employer uh, reputation as well. And some of those uh, kind of rankings and ideas actually uh, shape the higher education uh, landscape as we move forward. And as we speak in 2024, there are many universities that were influenced uh, by uh, that emergence of rankings in, in, in the previous uh, century. But then at the same time, uh, as we all know, since the, the higher education landscape and the higher education sector has been uh, evol evolving quite uh, a lot, and spe especially after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the way that we are engaging with um, <clears throat> various stakeholders, especially our students and, and the things that have changed. Uh, some of these rankings decided to update their, methodolo their methodological uh, kind of approaches to evaluate and assess different universities. And uh, for example, they try to also bring in or include uh, industry partnerships, collaborations, and also how does it influence uh, student choice when they first want to enter the university and 
and they have more or less some kind of ideas about their study choice. But now it comes to, for example, if you want to do uh, mechanical engineering, uh, which university within the, within your context is the best university to offer that specific academic program. But then at the same time, we know that these rankings, they definitely have influence uh, beyond uh, academia as well. And uh, especially, I think if you want to look at all of the relevant stakeholders, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really talking about internal and, ex uh, and external stakeholders in this specific case as well, uh, it does actually have uh, a, a huge kind of influence and impact. Uh, for example, especially in terms of international students and their parents when they want to uh, choose a destination and they want to go and study in a specific uh, country around the globe. But then at the same time, for example, when we look at uh, some of the external uh, stakeholders in this case, uh, policymakers, uh, funders, and government, they do actually look at uh, universities' uh, performance in their, in their rankings, and they, they try to uh, somehow align their, uh, their, their goals and objectives according to that base on, the, for example, the funding that they would allocate to a specific university in a specific location. But Getting back to the, 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 the topic of uh, today's uh, session, African universities in, in global rankings. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, there has been historical context when it comes to the global perspective. Uh, the same story is also true when it comes to African universities as, as well, especially over the past uh, 10 years, there has been a significant increase in terms of African universities who want to participate in, in global rankings. And in terms of uh, like uh, improving their uh, their rank and increasing their reputation and uh, and so forth, and it is also um, some universities they use this platform as an opportunity to uh, to enhance their global visibility and at the same time um, trying to uh, engage more in terms of some international collaborations that. Uh, are available out there, or rather some um, wider opportunities when it comes to uh, global engagement. And I, I mean, at the same time, one of the reasons behind that is also the, the government support that we have in, in various African countries in this regard. For example, in terms of developing and designing uh, specific or certain strategic uh, policies, they definitely play uh, a pivotal role in terms of strengthening uh, universities' ranking and especially when it comes to uh, research output and academic excellence when it comes to African universities. So um, I think uh, it is also interesting to look at some of the uh, stats and key trends when it comes to uh, the performance of African universities in world university rankings. As you are aware, there are uh, different types of rankings available out there. Some of them look at the overall performance of the university. Some of them are focusing on specific subject areas that they offer. Some of them, they focus on the impact rankings and how they are linked to, to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the societal impact and community engagement. But the stats that we have specifically on this slide are focusing on the, the, the overall performance of African universities uh, over the past uh, five years. And as you can see, back in 2018, there were only 27 African universities who actually participated in the Times Higher Education World University rankings, and that number has increased to 113 uh, last year. And at the same time, I think there has been uh, a kind of a diverse participation by uh, various countries around Africa, in terms of uh, increasing it from nine back again, 2018 to 17 in 2023. And uh, here I tried to highlight that, that the top seven African countries who are actually heavily involved and participate in the rankings. And as you can see, Egypt, Algeria, Nigeria, South Africa, and Morocco are amongst the, the top five countries and the number of universities within each country that actually participate uh, in the Times Higher Education World University rankings. But then at the same time, um, another uh, aspect or dimension that we can actually look at considering the, the topic of uh, performance is we can also try to look at it from the lens that how many universities were actually in the top 500, top 600 back in 2010 and how many 
are they now as we speak? And again, I think this is also going to give us uh, an, uh, another kind of insight in terms of uh, analyzing and interpreting the data from World University Rankings, because as you can see, for both uh, QS and THE, uh, back in um, 2010, 2009, there were only one or two universities uh, from Africa that were amongst the top 600 universities. And that number also uh, increased significantly back in 2023. And, and in, the, in the context of uh, THE impact rankings, um, I think again, as we speak, uh, based on the results that were announced last year, apparently as we speak, there are two universities from Africa that are amongst the uh, top 100 universities uh, in the world. Uh, of course, these are stats, uh, besides the fact that whether we are focusing on the topic of world university rankings and whether they are helpful or not, I think uh, it also tells us uh, a story in terms of all of these trends. They do actually highlight the, the increasing global competitiveness and academic excellence that uh, exists within the African uh, continent and specifically when it comes to African universities and at the same time it is somehow uh, maybe not a full reflection but a marginal reflection of a broader shift towards uh, higher education quality inequality uh, accessibility uh, student success and of course at the same time the number of research output and collaborations that have been happening uh, between African universities and global uh, north universities. And uh, the, the, the next one is also in terms of uh, African universities' performance when it comes to uh, impact rankings and how they are aligning their objectives and their goals when it comes to uh, looking at all 17 uh, SDGs, what are the initiatives, what are the projects that they do actually have already in place to make sure that they're able to measure all of these SDGs. Of course, uh, there are some limitations in terms of looking at all 17 of them, but yeah, I think uh, that the idea here with this slide is you would be able to look at how many universities from Africa we have in the top 100 within each SDG, how many African universities are within the top 100, and at the same time, uh, that the number in terms of uh, that, that the best uh, performed uh, university within uh, each SDG, which I think is going to also give uh, some kind of insights in terms of uh, what is happening within uh, within each SDG. Uh, but I, I mean, if someone wants to actually get into more details, then they would be able to go and look at the, the universities that are ranked within uh, each one of these SDGs. So earlier we mentioned the, the, the Sub-Saharan uh, Africa rankings that was launched back in uh, 2023, uh, and, and there were lots of uh, questions uh, around uh, this specific uh, ranking for the fact that, uh, in one hand, uh, uh, there is that uh, kind of uh, encouragement uh, between uh, Global North and Global South in order to collaborate and engage with one another, especially when it comes to uh, research collaborations and other uh, relevant initiatives and, and projects that, that are available out there. But then in, in and on the other hand, the question was like, uh, if we want to look at the Sub-Saharan Africa uh, specifically and its own context and its own uniqueness, and you also heard uh, from Dr. Masangu that he was talking about uh, some of the key challenges that we were experiencing, for example, in South Africa, then uh, there was like a different kind of opinion about this specific ranking. So again, uh, when you look at this ranking, they are more or less trying to uh, look at some quantitative data and traditional metrics that exist there for, 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 for quite a while. But at least I think in terms of some of the improvements that we can actually look at when it comes to this specific ranking, I think this is uh, one of the first rankings that they, they try to involve students as part of uh, this uh, process in terms of engaging with students and there is actually a survey that students need to complete in terms of uh, evaluating and assessing their own institution when it comes to teaching and research quality and other relevant uh, metrics. At the same time, it is also specifically focusing on uh, Africa impact, uh, how uh, various African universities that are located within Sub-Saharan Africa are actually engaging and collaborating uh, with one another and how they are making uh, an, an impact when it comes to uh, some global uh, challenges. 
But then at the same time, if we look at some of the metrics, for example, you will see that the, the number of low income students receiving financial aid has also been included, uh, I think, for the first time when it comes to this ranking. And, and we heard about uh, some of the challenges that uh, students and institutions are facing when it comes to uh, financial aid and financial sustainability of, of institutions. And also at the same time, the other idea behind this was uh, somehow try to combine both uh, qualitative and quantitative data, data sources. So we are not only focusing on uh, pure quantitative data and institutions are able to uh, share like more information and more content in terms of uh, what are some of the projects that are, that are currently happening within their own institutions. But of course, uh, there are some key challenges in general when we uh, look at uh, these uh, rankings. And I try to summarize, I think that, that the most uh, important key challenges that uh, universities are, are facing or they faced uh, in, in the past. And I think that the first one is in terms of data quality and data integrity to make sure that all of their uh, submitted data actually meets the requirements for various ranking agencies in terms of accuracy, completeness, uh, consistency, and also at the same time, in, in various cases, there are some uh, robust data governance practices or policies that are already being in place just in order to make sure that uh, there is a high quality standards in place. At the same time, resource allocation is uh, one of the other um, challenges that uh, universities are facing in terms of having a dedicated person or a dedicated team to collect and manage uh, data for for the purpose of the rankings and especially I think that is more crucial when it comes to uh, like a resource intensive kind of uh, cases and at the same time it requires lots of time as well uh, and that is linked to the next uh, point which is uh, adherence to standards and mapping and how we, we need to make sure that uh, students uh, not students uh, institutions kind of internal mapping actually link and align with the requirements from rankings, which is actually quite a complex process. And at the same, at the same time, it is also time consuming as well. And as I've said in one of the earliest slides, I think there's also that continuous improvement and updating that needs to take place in order to make sure that when there is a change in terms of methodology, how does uh, that actually reflect it in terms of the entire process or cycle that we have when it comes to data collection. So I think at the same time, uh, when it comes to, uh, again, I already mentioned uh, this in my first slide, so we can actually uh, classify um, the, the, the metrics and the indicators that we have as part of uh, these ranking systems, but mostly they are looking at is a specific subject uh, indicators and I think in some of instances, for example, especially when it comes to research, again, there is a question that whether, for example, H index or citations, are they uh, still like some kind of uh, reliable measures that we have in place when it comes to assessing and evaluating uh, universities' performance when it comes to research output and so forth. And at the same time, when it comes to finance, institutional income, research income, industry income, and, and you've heard about uh, that specific challenge when it comes to uh, South Africa as well. So I think uh, the last part of my um, of my slide and presentation, I just want to mention that uh, we can actually look at it uh, from, from also a different perspective, that uh, instead of uh, focusing specifically on the uh, competitiveness factor, universities competing with one another, I think we can also more focus on uh, collaboration as well. Uh, of course, we can learn from rankings and their performance, but then at the same time, in many instances, it is about unique success stories and collaborations that are happening within uh, each university that maybe we are not able to, to measure it as part of it in terms of how impactful their research are in terms of uh, community engagement, in terms of uh, the, 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 the mutual benefits that they might have in terms of their collaboration with, uh, with Global North. And at the same time, we also need to remember that when we're talking about collaboration, and specifically in this case, uh, in, the, in the African context, it is important to create regional networks within different continents and different locations, because 
that is one of many different ways that we will be able to amplify the collective voice of African universities, and that is going to enable uh, further collaboration initiatives. And it is also about the, the global uh, and improving the global recognition as well. But then at the same time, we also remember that uh, and we also need to be mindful of uh, our students, the, 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 the next generation, the future generations that we have and how we are able to empower them. And we have heard about some of uh, these challenges in South Africa, youth unemployment, but also in terms of what are the specific approaches that are unique to Africa when it comes to student success, when it comes to student-centric approaches. And also at the same time, in terms of uh, alumni, contributions as well, how they are able to uh, continue their, uh, their, their collaboration and their engagement with their respective uh, universities. And that's why it is also important to focus on data informed decision making. And in this specific case, I want to use uh, the, the, the HIMIS example in South Africa, which stands for, HIM for Higher Education Management Information System, which is a comprehensive uh, data management uh, system that we have in place and all of the universities are actually required to submit their data at the Department of Higher Education and Training. But the idea behind it is it is a centralized platform for collecting, analyzing, and reporting data. And then at the same time, you would be able to do the benchmarking and you would be able to look at all of the relevant aspects to student stuff, financial aspects, and uh, so forth, and also for the purpose of subsidies and the amount of subsidies that universities actually receive, receive when, when it comes to their data collection. So I think the, the last thing that I want to mention from my side, uh, because we were focusing on Africa, and I think uh, some of these initiatives are also might be like uh, linked to to rankings, but these are currently happening and they are already in place when it comes to, for example, data collection. There is a project African quality rating mechanism that is looking at all of the regional and public universities uh, as part of the Association of African Universities that is going to help them in terms of uh, collecting their data and also how to adhere to certain African standards and guidelines as well. At the same time, there is, for example, uh, the African Data Hub that was uh, initiated and started back uh, in 2020 when we had the COVID-19 pandemic and also the African Research Universities Alliance as well, which was launched back in 2015. And these are like some of the collaborations that are happening within the continent at the moment that are definitely going to benefit universities, especially in those cases that uh, we have low resource data or when it comes to the higher education sector, we don't have enough data for decision making. So uh, I think that the key question here is when it comes to ranking, I think probably in terms of the future is there's going to be a more focus and shift in terms of uh, societal impact, in terms of collaborative partnerships, not only amongst universities or institutions anymore, but also in terms of uh, governments and industry and, and all of the relevant uh, stakeholders. But I think the implications at the end of the day for African universities is they need to focus on their own kind of capabilities and what they already have in place in order to further leverage it. And, uh, and in some instances, as I've already mentioned, they, they are uh, being in fact full and has already been uh, shown a significant impact at a, at a global level. So I think, yes, that's everything from uh, my side. Wow, thank you, um, Hussein. That was uh, fascinating. And there's loads of, I've just been trying to keep up with the questions as well, because we've got quite a lot of questions. Some are related, and um, I'll try and do them justice. We've got plenty of time, or at least some time, to answer some of these questions. So I'm not going to go through them in order, um, but I just wanted to pull out, first of all, there's a question from Louise around um, your view on more than our rank. I'll start with that. Not least because Lizzie Gad, as I said, um, she's the chair of EII norms, and I did actually have on the slide at the beginning. Um, so she's just asking for a comment on what you think of more than our rank. But I did before a comment of my own, if you like. Um, so I suppose one of the things that I'm in, I'm interested in with more than our rank, my kind of understanding of it is that it's quite carefully positioned um, to uh, mitigate concerns from the big 
universities in the global north that you know do our su still subscribe to the, the rankings uh, but really you know rather trying to shift the conversation to discuss our universities in different geographical and social contexts which is that uh, they've been saying actually are more than their rank you know but that doesn't necessarily yes. mean that you as a research group Gosby Russell group say a research intensive in the global north need to withdraw I mean just to bring that in with another question that's been asked um around the increased presence of African universities in the rankings, you know, is perhaps now the wrong time to think about abandoning these rankings completely. But of course, there has been a high profile case recently where Utrecht University has withdrawn. So just trying to pull out the sort of synergies between those sort of questions in terms of how we can shift the narrative, really, while accepting that, you know, these things are going to stick around, aren't they, I think, and obviously you're involved with the sub-Saharan rankings so that's uh trying to sort of synthesize a couple of questions there but uh, yeah so your thoughts on some of those issues uh, yes uh, i think uh, in terms of the more than our rank it's, it's definitely uh, an interesting initiative and idea i, I think it is uh, linked to uh, what we have already discussed as part of our presentation in in terms of uh, how quickly the higher education landscape is keep shifting and also in terms of i think i haven't mentioned uh, technological advancement as well i think that is also another uh, element that we can also bring in in terms of how is it going to shift universities mindset and, and all of that and i think uh, more or less the, the, the idea behind it in terms of uh, i think from from what i've read and from my understanding is i think again is trying to encourage institutions to 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 rather more collaborate with, with one another rather than only focusing on the on the competitiveness element uh, of things which i think it is important in one instance but then in, in other instances i think when, when we when we look at the, the the global knowledge and how we would be able to transfer knowledge across uh, different continents and across different countries and institutions i think that's that's definitely uh, a great initiative that is going to accelerate that kind of that kind of mindset. I think in terms of the, the second point that you mentioned, I think that's a, that's a, an interesting one, but also at the same time, it's a difficult one as well, because I think uh, in, in, in one hand, especially uh, from, from what I've seen over the past five years, it seems like uh, there is that uh, kind of uh, appetite, especially in Africa, from African universities to, to participate in these rankings and make sure that they are able to improve. But I think uh, on the other hand, and I completely agree with you, I think uh, that, that that part in terms of making that decision is also something difficult, whether you want to participate or you don't want to participate. I think that's a completely different story. But I think uh, as, as Empolisi mentioned in his uh, last slide, we, we also need to be mindful of uh, universities' uh, strategic plans and what is the vision that uh, they have for themselves. Because I think the moment that you have that strategic plan, the, the, your university's mission and vision already in place, then I think that would be the main focus area. And then of course, as, as part of that process and as part of that journey, you can look at some of these rankings and see that maybe there are like some indicators or metrics that you would, you would actually be able to take into consideration as part of that. But I think it shouldn't be a, a major act uh, to uh, somehow distract universities from, from the initial objectives, the initial goals, and what did they want to, or, or how they would actually see themselves, for example, in the next five to 10 years in, in the mm -hmm. higher education. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to acknowledge Jan Diswa, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, uh, this question, which I think is related to some of what you were just saying, but they go on to um, ask you to comment on how the rankings, which are, as we've discussed, very metric focus, focused, advance the values of Ubuntu and collaboration between Africa and Global South universities rather than Western values and ideologies. Um, so I certainly don't know enough about that. Could you comment on that? Um, I'm, I'm also not, not sure about uh, that, but but I think, uh, again, if we want to get back to, the, to, to, the, to our context in terms of focusing on African universities, I think that the question is, in one hand, uh, universities in Africa, they want to improve and increase their capacity within the content that is going to help the, the, the youth unemployment rate and all of those factors. But I think from, from the research 
uh, side of things, uh, there's a still going to be, and I think that is a still going to be like a, like a challenging factor because in one hand, you will see that, for example, I, I haven't mentioned it as part of my presentation. I think when we look at the research metric and when it comes to rankings, and uh, there is also this question around uh, what are the top uh, journals that are being considered as part of, uh, you know, rankings. And, and I think there is also a debatable question around that as well. Like you have to specifically publish in high impactful journals in order to make sure that you are going to participate in the rankings or whether you are publishing the top 5%, top 10%. I think that is also going to create another question in terms of that collaboration between Global South and, and Global North. So I think there are currently like some of these challenges that exist. And as you said, it's not it's not like they're going to uh, like change uh, within a short period of time. It requires, mm -hmm. you know, some kind of like awareness and the things that needs to take place. Yeah, thank you. And just on that note, because yes. there's, there's a question here that's come up in the chat from Leanne, who's my colleague, actually, um, for transparency of bibliometrician here in the in the, uh, one of my team colleagues. So she's asking, which relates directly to that, I think. Um, she wants to ask about the process behind using else or your thoughts on the process behind using Elsevier data for the sub-Saharan rankings. So her, admittedly, she's saying limited research indicated that Elsevier Scopus does not index as many African journals and African institutions. They also have a high subscription cost. So if institutions want to interrogate that data and take proactive steps to ensure it is correct, this will have financial impact. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, is there is a, there is another database that indexes a far greater number of outputs and institutions dimensions which we're looking at as well, which is from digital science, um, although that would still have an associated cost. And just on this point as well, I went to a very interesting presentation recently through the Forum for Open Research in MENA, Middle East and Northern Africa. I don't know if you're familiar with that organisation. Yes. Um, I forget the colleague's name that was speaking, but he was from the Open Journal System, and he was talking about how that system, the Open Journal System, which is an open source platform for publishing journals, um, is very prevalent in the Global South, but it's not indexed by Scopus or some of the other databases. Interesting, Leon, to explore whether it's indexed by di dimensions to a more greater extent. So that means all that research is effectively invisible. Um, so that I think directly relates to that, you know, and that's a really systemic issue that um, perhaps yes. we haven't addressed today. I know Lizzie spoke about it a bit, but there's a lot of sort of meaty stuff there for you to comment. Yes, I, I, I think maybe just one comment from my side. I think um, that the question around bibliometrics and research data, that, that's definitely, I think, is a valid point in terms of uh, what are the some, some of the limitations that we currently have. But I think also on the, on the other side, when you look at, for example, in some instances, in terms of the data infrastructure and technologies that universities have in place, I think sometimes uh, they, they also maybe think beyond rankings in terms of just using some of those platforms in terms of doing some kind of benchmarking with other universities. I think that is also maybe like another aspect that we can also take into consideration because in some instances, if the data is not available, if the infrastructure is not already being in a place in order to collect that data, then I think that, that the only for improvement would be to look at what are the other alternatives. And I think in that specific case, that's why universities are interested to use, for example, uh, you, you mentioned dimensions. I think there's SILA as well that is used by THC and QS specifically. I think there's also another there's one, also alt metrics. Today, I yeah, I think alt metrics as well, specifically looking at the, the societal impact. Yeah, I think so that might also be like the reason why institutions are tending to use some of these platforms. But yeah, I think in terms of the Elsevier database, I've also noticed that one as part of our analysis in terms of the, the, the lack of visibility when it comes mm -hmm. to uh, African journals. Yeah, and I think that's, that's, that's really a, a good point. And uh, perhaps again, to come back to Louise's question, they're, they're very long questions. Thanks everyone, but I'm struggling to sort of pass them up in a, in a sensible way. So just to come back to Louise's question, and I think it relates to some of the, the points that um, Andiswa has been making as well in the chat and in the questions around um where's the comment so and this were in the chat was saying we need a new system of it's built on social justice values context specific assessed values of universities which i think we all kind of agree on notwithstanding the the inertia of these of these things um but related to that perhaps um louise who asked the question about in arms and more than our rank goes on to mention the cwts leiden leiden rankings 
and that that actually tries to move beyond the problematic features of global university rankings that are based in part on reputational surveys and that notably um, apparently African universities consistently score higher in the Leiden rankings um, which also makes use of only open and queryable data um, so again that relates to some of the previous conversations yes. I don't know if you've got any comments on Biden yes I, I think actually the the, the CWTS one is it, it, also another I think interesting ranking in terms of overcoming some of the challenges and obstacles that we are experiencing and the things that has actually been discussed and I think the the, the idea also the another idea behind it which I think it is something completely unique and different is that for example if you want to go and look at your own institution's performance it they've created some kind of a user-friendly or, or a business intelligence platform that you would be able to interact and export your data and then you would be able to use it for decision making whereas in some other instances for example when you go to the website you might only be able to see your performance but the question is in terms of the raw data and what has actually been put into place as an input into that ranking i think that is also uh, like a, mm -hmm. a limitation yeah but i think the cwts one and i know that especially this year they, they have revised their, their methodology in a way that they are counting and i think they are not uh, i'm not sure whether they are still using uh, lcv or scopus but i think they also try to um, bring in some other kind of platforms in terms of looking at uh, mm -hmm. so i think that that's definitely a an interesting uh, one to look at. And it relates as well, doesn't it? As, as colleagues may be aware of the Berlin Declaration on Open Research Infrastructure, whatever it's called, that's just been published, or Open Research Information. Uh, that's quite a new initiative that's just... Yes, this, yes, uh, that is also uh, new, you know, yes. And then trying to move in that direction as well. We are pretty much out of time. I just wanted to sort of finish by thinking back to this sort of contextual question. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really yours was the first question, but the last one I'm going to sort of take before we close. Um, and I suppose this is an interesting thing to think about in the context of context as we've been discussing. So they're saying it may be interesting to look into the strategic approach of historically black universities in the US regarding ranking and to possibly build alliances with them, especially from the perspective of um, uh, the uh, HDI universities in South Africa and beyond. Um, I mean, my initial reaction to that is that the, the social contexts and demographics are quite different. But do you think there's anything in that sort of collaboration uh, yes yes no, i think uh definitely the, the the context and the history are different when you want to compare those two regions but i think of course at the end of the day you can you can always uh, look at the, the other success stories that have been happening around the globe and then we'll be able to see how we can further implement it in as part of uh, our initiatives and our planning purposes yeah, no, that's great. Thanks. Um, this question is still flying in, and uh, I'm just going to formally draw us to a close, um, uh, but we can still answer a couple of these questions to say, and I don't know how much of a rush you're in to get off. Uh, no, I, I, I think we can we can do like another five, ten minutes. I don't okay, mind. yeah, so if people want to leave, understandably, that's, that's fine, but yes. uh, this is being recorded, and uh, we can continue to have a conversation if colleagues would like to. Um, I'm just trying to see what I've missed. Uh, one's just coming from my colleague, Sala. So Sala um, is a colleague I've worked with, actually. We, we did a presentation, didn't we, Sala, to um, the forum for MENA um, back at the end of last year. Um, so she's asking, do you think not getting enough money from governments in African places makes the made the rankings worse? Nowadays, even usual universities, so universities in the, north, in the global north, worry about ranking and being open. But because of not having enough resource, Maybe some universities won't be in the ranking anymore. So it, again, it comes down to economics, doesn't it? I suppose is the hardest point. Yes. Um, yes. At the okay. and, and I think also at the same time, uh, when we're looking at the, the financial aspect of things, and especially how it's it's linked to 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 rankings, I think again, uh, it's, it's in terms of so you have the, the total institutional income, and then you have your research income, and then you have your industry income. But then, especially when it comes to um, industry income. Again, I think that there is a major challenge there as well in terms of like, again, whether you are collaborating with uh, local industry partners or you are collaborating with international uh, kind of uh, partners and all of those issues. And I think, again, in some instances, and I think uh, Dr. Masango also mentioned it in one of his slides, and maybe that is something that it's a kind of a a global trend, but there's always, you know, going to be that question and that disadvantage because when you're looking at it historically and in some instances, 
maybe that research income for some universities has been quite uh, significant. And it has also been increasing over the years and it has become common. So now the question is going to be, what are the possible ways that the other universities would be able to cope up with that? Yeah, and, but I think, as you mentioned, there are definitely some kind of uh, economical factors and also political factors involved as, as, as part of uh, finances. I think that's always the case. Yeah. I think we've almost done all the questions now and I've we've actually got another presentation this, another event this afternoon if colleagues do want to come to that if you're still here I'll post a link to that in a moment one of our open lunch series um, but maybe this is a good point to uh, to finish on given our discussions around collaboration and the problematic nature of the rankings etc so at, from your perspective specifically at the University of Pretoria and your involvement as part of the sub-Saharan African rankings to what extent do you think rankings encourage collaboration and to support achieving social impact or the vision of an institution versus undermining them? So that's a sort of binary question, I suppose, you know, that obviously there's not yes. a binary an answer, but what, what's your... Yes. Give us, a, uh, yeah, think... give us a, a, a binary answer if you can. <laughs> no, I'm not going to give you a binary answer, but I think, uh, yeah, I think it's... Uh, I'm going to use the case of, for example, impact rankings. I think that's a good one because we're trying to see how it encourages collaboration and how does it impact uh, societal kind of things. And I think, uh, especially when it comes to uh, collaboration, I think also another topic that I think we then have uh, enough time to discuss it today is also, you know, that the new topic around multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, and interdisciplinarity, in other words, known as MIT. So I think that that specific concept is also another element that is definitely going to play a significant role when it comes to uh, collaboration across different universities and rankings are somehow encouraging that. But getting back to, I think, impact rankings specifically, I think from, from, from what I've seen, uh, especially in the sub-Saharan Africa and especially in uh, within the South African context, I think in, in some instances, uh, although that we, 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 are, we are aware of all of the challenges, but in some, in some cases, I think when you look at some of the measures, when you look at some of the parameters and indicators that we would be able to see as part of some of these rankings, actually universities would be able to somehow initiate that and embed it within their, their planning purposes. So I think if, for example, there is one specific university that is performing quite well in SDG 5, I'm just using that one as an example, then I think their ranking has created that kind of uh, platform for other universities to actually go and look at those specific initiatives and projects and try to see how they would be able to learn from them. Another good example, I think, uh, that the TH impact rankings one, I have seen that most of the universities, even the ones that that are not necessarily participating in that specific ranking, uh, they have created a designated web page on their, on, their, on their website that are highlighting all of their projects and initiatives that are linked to various kind of SDGs. And I think uh, besides ranking, whether we want to think about them or not, and how it's going to be impactful, I think that is, that is just like a, some kind of a, a useful uh, information that is available out there. Of course, not only for, for the universities and institutions and students and stuff, but I think it is also going to create that kind of awareness amongst the, the, the public and society. To try to see that, what do we mean in terms of SDGs and what are the projects that are currently happening uh, between different universities? Yeah, so I think in that sense, and we can say that it is somehow supporting that collaboration and encouraging universities to further collaborate with one another in terms of identifying gaps, but then at the same time, areas of improvements as well. I will have to draw it to a close now. There's one final question that's just come in, um, just asking around the proposed ranking, why is, why is it taking for sub-Saharan Africa only? What are some of the barriers for creating a full, fully African ranking that includes all parts of the continent? Um, so I guess Northern Africa tends to be grouped more with Europe, maybe, I don't know. Or... Uh, yes, I think that, that that is also one of the <clears throat> one of the topics that uh, we, we are currently discussing with, uh, with, 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 with uh, the Sub-Saharan team as well, so to try to see that, uh, because you've seen in one of my slides, I was looking at the top five countries with the most uh, number of participants in terms of rankings, and I think four out of five countries were actually located in North Africa. So then now that, that's going to be, I think, it's definitely a, a, a valid and critical question, and I'm not sure that 
how uh, it will be addressed in the future. But yeah, I think it's, it's something that definitely we can take into consideration maybe in the next round of looking at the methodology and how we'll be able to revise it going forward. Okay, well, that's great. Thank you very much, Hussein. And thanks to all our uh, colleagues that have joined and some are still here. Um, I will draw us to a close. Now, I did just post a couple of links to, if you are available to you, you're welcome to come to our um, open lunch event then. Uh, and I've also posted a link to the next Ken event. But thank you very much to you, Hussein, and thanks to thank you very much, Nick. in uh, in his absence. Uh, do pass on thank our you. thanks and uh, we'll... Thank uh, you very much for your invite. I'll speak to you again. Thanks, thanks everyone. Okay. And uh, thank you. I'll close the meeting in a moment, but uh, just give it a few moments while people say goodbye. So thank you.